This business shouldn't have done so well. And I think one of the reasons that I had is because we don't have any investors. We don't have any advisors. I've never really listened to anyone else who would say, oh, you can't do this. And if someone else has said that, I'm just like, you don't know what you were talking about. So I was working in an admin job, which was very boring. Like, I hated it. It was very mind numbing. But I felt like I wanted to start something like Simmer back then. Obviously, what we sell is food. But what we actually sell is like time. It's health. It's a satisfaction from food. It's a feeling of more confidence and empowerment. So we help people Simmer up. Welcome to the Bay HQ where we inspire, connect, and guide the next generation of British Asians. Smash that subscribe button if you watch us on YouTube, and leave us a five-star review if you're listening on Apple or Spotify. Today we have with us Simi Dillon, who's the founder of Simmer, which is a healthy meal delivery service. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Good. So thanks so much for coming down. No worries. And you're one of the first people who come on the podcast who I actually use your product and you used it for way before I was even thinking about this podcast, right? So... Back when you were R&S Mills, I used to get that and I pretty much lived off it, to be honest, when I was in the pandemic especially. Yeah. I'm not the best chef, but it's nice to know that you always have a healthy meal. But if we rewind for a second, right? When you're growing up, did you think like one day you could be running your own business and doing what you're doing today? Or what were your ambitions back then? Growing up, obviously, as kids, me and Jay like, wanted to be footballers. That was like the dream. But I feel like I realized I was always quite like sharp and I loved business. And I always said to Jay that I think we realized Jay wanted to go into football. I was going to go into academia or go into finance. But we always said that we would start our own business together one day. We thought that that would be like in our 30s. Once like I'd done like the initial years in, in like a finance career, made lots of money whilst Jay had gone to play football. And it's like then once you're in your 30s, you're set up and you can then start the business. Maybe that's also because we had a bias in our head that you have to be a certain age to start a business as well. Yeah, we'd always talk about when younger, like we're going to start a business, we're going to do all these things. Um, so yeah, definitely. And like, what's the age gap between you two? Only 18 months. So he's 18 months older than me. Yeah, so for people who don't know, obviously that's your brother, right? Yeah. And you started the business, you've been running it together. Obviously business started about your university, right? What were you studying then? Why did you pick that? So initially I went to um, Warwick and I was studying maths and, and then I dropped out after a term. I really wasn't enjoying it and I realised that was actually the wrong course for me. So I switched to um, Bristol and I was studying economics. Where did Simmer come into this or the original version of yeah. Simmer? So actually when I dropped out of university the first time, I had a lot of time on my hands and I really wanted to start doing something that because I, I feel like there can like i think on gap years you can do some schemes with, with companies which are quite productive and, and interesting and and useful but because i'd taken like a an unplanned half gap year i didn't really have the opportunity to do any of those things so i was working in an admin job which was very boring like i hated it it was very um mind-numbing and it was just eating away at me that i was spending my time going into an office going home and not being able to work on anything so i was reading lots anyway but i felt like i wanted to start something like um simmer back then for the people i was working in the office with i was going to do it i tested the recipes but when it came to actually starting i didn't start it because i just thought i was a kid everyone else was a lot older they would be like why are we going to buy food off you i wasn't sure if i was allowed to do it in in the workplace because they were like this guy's here for the summer like should he be doing that? So yeah, that's kind of initially where I had the idea. And then when I got to university, I kind of forgot about the idea. And then obviously I'm seeing like the problem, which is like people not having food that like satisfies them. It's not healthy. It's not tasty. It's not convenient. But then I waited until I'd got my first lot of exams out of the way um, in January of my first year. And then I, then I started it. With the initial dropout, right? How hard was that for you? Because obviously as like an Asian person, right? Dropping out of university, people you worry what people are going to say all that kind of stuff was that did that affect um, you at all not so much i think um it was like my own like internal kind of like pressure because the school i went to wasn't that great and i was probably a bit too cocky uh when i was at school so uh i think a lot of people were actually shocked that i like gone to uni hadn't just like done really well and, and gone through it so i think initially I, I hated it in the first couple of weeks and wanted to drop out i thought i can't i, I need to give it a go and i kept on doing that kept on doing that i said i can't drop out what really hard but it's good that i did like um persevere with it because i knew that when i did come to actually formally withdrawing it was 100 percent the right decision because i'd given it like tried everything and i was like this still isn't enjoyable this still isn't what i want to do but yeah that was definitely a challenge and i think it was like my first real kind of like uh setback because i'd always just done really well like a defining point in my life and it's really nice that i had that kind of setback at kind of the perfect time because obviously it meant that i got to experience a new university where i started a business yeah because i think a lot of people maybe will just 
carry on going through it and then maybe they have a setback at a later point in life where actually I think it's better to to have that failure when you're younger old enough to understand it but at that kind of age is probably the best time to, for it to happen I think one of the things a lot of people talk about in business as well is like persistence right and sometimes what happens is that people keep doing something even when they know it's not working it's sometimes it's knowing something's not right for you and also as business as well like if it's not going to work you can also quit and then not be it's a failure in some regard but you've also learned sometimes knowing when to give up is and it's not just giving up, it's putting your resources somewhere else, right? Yeah. And that's what led to where you are today. Yeah, I think there's a balance because I think a lot of people, especially in like this day and age, um, quit very easily and quit very quickly. So yeah, on the other hand, people just stick to what they're doing. So it's about getting it right. It's like being like kind of um, committed enough um, to something, but also knowing when is the right moment to switch, to pivot. To If we go to where you started in a university now, right, with the, with like, selling the mills. You said you were scared about doing it at the workplace before. What made you actually do it then? What was the first step you took? Was it just to your friends or how did you go about starting the actual business? I knew that it would be quite an easy sell because my where my campus was, it was a little bit outside of like the city. And also this was 2017. So whilst delivery was a thing then, it didn't serve lots of areas. So it was out of the radius for delivery. No one could get delivery to our campus. I think the only uh, the only takeaway that would deliver uh, was Domino's. So basically Domino's or cook yourself. So I, I realized I only had one kind of competitor or two, if, if you know, I think about cooking. So it just seemed like a bit of a no brainer. And then I realized that this was better than the other options. So it should be easy for me to sell it. Um, so I tested a few recipes, tried to give a bit to my flatmates and they were like, oh, this is really great. Um, better than anything that we make. And then, yeah, just made a Facebook page and started marketing it. Um, and it just took off. Because initially you're making all the food yourself as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you scale that up when you started getting orders in? So yeah, I, I would just literally, I, I had quite a steady, like I knew, I knew that orders would come in. So I'd market it in the morning kind of, or like the night before, try and take orders, but then also just like on the day, People would call up. I just say, okay, cool. I'll be like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I'd go in, I'd make the food and then literally walk to deliver to them because everyone, like the furthest distance I'd have to walk to a customer was like eight minutes. I think one of the tough things a lot of people at the beginning as well is like how to price that. How did you go about trying to work out how much do I charge for this? Are people going to pay? Yeah. Um, it's funny because like I sold, like I was one of those kids obviously sold like sweets and, and chocolates and crisps on the playground. And from that experience, I know that like you always want to charge 50p or a pound because it's a round number. And I remember when some people would try and charge 80p for things or one pound to rent, it just, it's hassle. And I guess this was in 2017 as well, where now like I don't carry any cash ever because it's just inefficient. So I was just like five pounds. It's just a round number. You're going to either have a five pound note or I'll have change or, so it's just uh, quite simple. And when did you start thinking about this something which, because obviously it was just a side hustle at the beginning, right? When did you think, thinking maybe this could be like my full-time thing? Like years later, probably the first time I actually thought that, without wanting to like jump head too much, because I know the missing parts out, but that was 2017. It wasn't until summer 2019, so two and a half years later, uh, when I was interning at Google and someone said to me, uh, I think you've got a lot of potential here uh, for this business. And I think it was someone credible saying that to me. And then I thought, actually, oh, well, if he's saying it, then then actually there is potential here. Because before that, even though like mates or the other people at university would say, oh, this is pretty cool, like what you can do next. I kind of, in a way, didn't like, there's this phrase of like believability, uh, waiting like decisions or like opinions. And I felt like a lot of people that I knew, I wasn't going to be like, oh, that's a credible source for like, business yeah. advice or or input. So it was, wasn't until that point where I actually, thought, oh, actually, there's something here. Obviously, you're doing it at university. And like you said, university is a captive audience, right? You had only dominoes and people cooking as a competitor. Yeah. Once you left university, you started doing interns and things yeah. like that. How did you then transition the business? So I, I was doing it for the first like kind of six months from January 2017 till summer. And then obviously uni finished. Um, so I went home uh, to Hitchin and then I was like to Jay and mum, we should we should start doing this here. So that was quite fun over summer trying to serve a different audience. We also like developed a few different dishes. Uh, we had different challenges because obviously we, have to, we had to deliver a bit further. We stopped just using Facebook and started using Instagram as well. Yeah, that was an interesting challenge. It was fun, uh, really enjoyable. And then uh, I went back to uni for second year and I kind of lost my whole market because everyone was living together. Now everyone's living out across the city. So that was a lot tougher. And I tried to pivot away from takeaways, like healthy takeaways to um, meal prep. That was a, like a, a pivot that we had as a business, um, which was good because it increased the average order value. There was a lot more kind of repeatability there. 
because people would get it each week as well. And there was kind of like, we didn't have food waste before because we always like kind of cook to order and we always have. But this way, we were just a lot more efficient because you would turn the ovens on and you'd cook for 10, 15, 20, 50 meals as opposed to two, three meals. University became a lot more demanding. So I, I kind of thought that actually about quitting then because I was like, oh, we've, we've had fun with this. It's been good, made a little bit of money. Um, some great experience but um, I don't think this is very scalable and then it got to the point where I kind of didn't want to leave it I, I think I became quite attached to it it was really fun and I felt like it would be a shame to leave it maybe it was also a bit of a pride thing um, because I feel like a lot of my identity had now been attached to it especially because of everyone I knew at university pretty much as long as they'd known me I'd be doing the business um, so it kind of felt like a, a shame um, to stop it but then it was the point where I couldn't do both um, it was like I wasn't going to my lectures I was just cooking and, and trying to make it work but it wasn't working I was very tired burnt out and then I kind of got to the realisation I had to either stop the business completely or um, take a year off of university um, to really focus on it and make it self-sufficient and hire people and um, yeah that was uh, the year after and is that what you did then so you took that year off so actually so a year off starting 2018 January, I decided to, as a bit technical, to defer my January exams and not take them because I hadn't gone to any of my lectures, stay at university, do my summer exams. And then when they gave me like resets, like there was a technicality, a bit of a loophole where if you take your exams and do poorly uh, or if you fail them, you can't like, you're capped at like a 40%. Mm -hmm. so I didn't, obviously didn't want to do that and I didn't want yeah. to do poorly. But if you defer them again, it would basically um, force a supplementary year, which is basically where you reset the year. But I could do that um, remotely without paying tuition fees. So I knew that was going to happen, deferred the exams again, forced a supplementary year, which basically was a, a year for me to build my own placement year because I didn't offer that. So that's what I ended up doing um, and realising that we had to like find a new premises, hire staff. And Where did you hire the staff? Was that in Hitchin or was that Bristol? In, in Hitchin. I kind of decided at a point in the second year that Bristol and students was, was finished. That's how we started, but that wasn't going to be the future. Yeah, and it was going to be like working people because they had more money and we would focus more on, on the meal prep side of things because it was a better business and I guess more meaningful as well. And at this time, was your family really involved in this? How were they involved in the stage? How much of the time was you versus them? What was that dynamic like? So when I got back to second, so after that summer, it was me, Jay and mum were doing quite a lot of it. I'd probably say more so me and mum. Well, I was doing most of the business stuff. I would basically like call mum and say, oh, we've got one or two orders here. She'd cook it. And then one of us would deliver it. And then uh, Jay was helping out as and when he could, but he was still like very much focused on football at that time and helping out as he could. And then when I went back to university, I would still basically be taking calls from customers or like people would call up and then, because it's just my mobile number, I'd be like, hello. I wouldn't say hello. Oh, could you want to take an order? I was like, hello. And they'd be like, hello. And they're like, is this Rice and Spice? I was like, oh yes, yes, yes. Um, would you like to place an order? Uh, where are you calling from, Hitchin or Bristol? So it's just like a really weird thing. Like there's just one number for, for everything. Yeah. Um, and then if it was Hitchin, I would take the order um, and then call it through to mum and then she would cook it and deliver it. If it was Bristol, I would do it. Yeah, it was a bit of a, it was very informal. I got, so obviously then, did you, you then completed university or did you drop out again? Or what happened there? Uh, so I did my first year, did quite well. Second year, I did half my exams uh, the summer and I got a first, that was great. And then I deferred them. So I would basically have to take half of my second year whilst running the business remotely. Yeah. So did you actually complete the degree in the end? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So then like once you left the degree then, you didn't straight away decide to go full-time, right? So no, you no, did no. the internships and stuff. Yeah. What was behind not trying to go full-time then? Because I didn't think it was a scalable business. I just thought that um, the reason I was taking the year off is because I felt like I'd done a lot of work in starting something. There was something potentially special here that I could make this a self-sufficient business and then I could potentially not have to run it. So either I could have some passive income from it, I can give Jay and mum something that there's a business for you guys to run and it would be enjoyable for them to run it and they would make a bit of money. I would make a bit of money. Yeah, I, I guess it, would, it was like, the intention wasn't to make it some crazy business, like a startup mm. or a large business. It was just like a fun business that was um, profitable and um, satisfied a need. And um, yeah, because obviously it's a product that we use every day. So it would also be good to basically have a, pro a business that I could eat for free with. <laughs> yeah. And you said there was a guy at Google that then encouraged you to take it full time, right? Yeah. What then changed in that mindset for you then? Just once you've been told by somebody credible, yeah, this has got legs. Yeah, well, actually, it wasn't one person. It was everyone I spoke to were like, oh, this is really interesting. Like, they were like, you shouldn't come back here. You yeah. like, they were like, oh, 
they'll give you an offer that everyone loves you here you, you'll come back like you can give you can have an you can come back if you want to but don't go and work on this thing like you're clearly so much more passionate about it it's got a lot of potential uh, and um the guy who who uh, the specific guy who I was um, speaking to actually used to work for HelloFresh and then he worked for Google and he was like oh HelloFresh was first a tech company second a food company and I didn't realize at the time how much companies are worth but HelloFresh was worth like hundreds of millions billions and I was like oh that was like quite mind blowing for me that a food business can be worth that much because it wasn't a food business it was a tech business so off the back of that I think I, I learned quite a lot about like obviously working in a big tech company about automation and like just how things are done. Uh, at that kind of like level. So I felt like automation was a big thing that we needed to have in our business. Um, so literally after him saying that, I was like, I need a developer. We need to automate so many processes. So I went out and and, and found a developer. Um, a friend of mine was working in the startup. This guy was a developer there. He was meant to do like an eight week project on the website. It ended up going from eight weeks to just like part-time indefinitely and then full-time. So he ended up quitting his job to come and work on the business as well. Yeah, but that's the the point where I thought, oh, there's potential here. But even then, I didn't think that I would go work on the business full time. I just thought that was potential. As that transition happened, like what were the different steps that took you to, this is it, now I'm quitting my job, I'm going full time? Yeah, it was a very slow process because um, I didn't end up quitting until um, Q1 of 2021. So it was four years of starting. So it was a very long time. Mm -hmm. It was very like, there wasn't any like big thing that happens or it was just like very slow, very gradual. And if you think about like the business where it is today, pretty much everything has been like just built from scratch from the website to the brand, the marketing, the operations, the factory themselves, the menu. Um, and it's great that I've basically had like a lot of input on all of that and understand it all, all really well and inside out. I think sometimes a lot of people think you need to quit your job, then start the business. Mm -hmm. When in reality, you can do it on the side and yeah. you did it a lot longer than many people might expect as well. Sometimes yeah. people think, oh, you started for a couple months, then you quit your job. Mm -hmm. But are you glad you did it that way? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm so glad that I did it. Like, I feel like I did it the perfect way. Starting a business in your first year of university, finishing your degree, having the experience of internships, even having the experience of a graduate job, and then basically being in a position where you've graduated, you've been in a job for six months, your business is already turning over like uh, a million pounds a year. Great. And it's profitable. Like it's just, it's the perfect situation. I, I couldn't have asked it for it to be any better. And when you went into it full time then, what was it like you were thinking, okay, now that I'm full time, what can I do now? Right. What were you? Yeah. I think this what I'm going to be able to. Impact yeah. I, I thought, oh, now I go full time. This is going to be like, I think that year, like, obviously um, revenue was like, um, or the ARR, the annual recurring revenue was a million. Mm -hmm. We haven't actually made a million pounds at that point, but that quarter we'd made like, a quarter of a million so we were on for for a million revenue i thought oh well within like a year we'll go to, 10, to like 10 million then we'll go to 100 then we'll go to like a billion and like, it just doesn't work like <laughs> that um like yeah obviously as you get bigger it's, it's so much harder to, to double and triple and, and and 5x and 10x yeah i think i um you you obviously work within a certain like size of market size of business and you forget about a lot of things that when you scale, it becomes a lot harder. So yeah, I thought it, it, would, it would just fly um, quite naively, but I'd always been just quite naive and it worked out. So yeah, it didn't work out quite that way. I think sometimes as well, people forget like, to become a successful entrepreneur, you need a little bit of delusion, right? Yeah. You need to be able to believe that you can break something or do something better than other people can. Yeah. And sometimes you don't know that until you start. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what holds people back sometimes. You need a bit of like, delusion. Like, yeah, I'm going to be, this is going to be a billion dollar company next year. Yeah. Because if you shoot for the stars, right, then it, yeah. you land on some moon, right? It's like, yeah. you've got to do that sometimes. Yeah, I think as well, um, potentially one of the reasons why this business has done so well is because it, like this business shouldn't have done so well. And I think one of the reasons that I had is because we don't have any investors. We don't have any, have any advisors. I've never really listened to anyone else who would say, oh, you can't do this. And if someone else has said that, I'm just like, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, like, I don't need to worry about what you're, what you're saying, basically. You're the person who started the business. You're the one that passion. You're, you've got one who's got it this far for a reason. And it's tough sometimes for a lot of people to know. It's like, when do you listen? When do you not listen? I think there are a lot of nuances, like if you're a first-time founder or not, if you've worked in that industry before, who your advisors are, who your mm -hmm. investors are, if you're doing something completely different. Because like, yeah, a, a lot of businesses will try and do things the same way. Because uh, there is a way of doing business. It's like raising money, developing your product, hitting like economies of scale trying to acquire users as quickly as you can they all acquire them in the same way and if you kind of deviate from that then they don't like that they don't believe in that it's kind of like let's do it this way or we're gonna have problems basically were you ever tempted to try and take on investment uh we never really needed it i didn't even know you could take on investment like i thought the only way you do it is oh you take out a bank loan i didn't know what vc was i didn't know 
like what angel investors are um, for a long time until we didn't need them. Obviously, I understand that there are benefits of raising money, um, but I feel like every like there are some industries that you have to raise money, like lots of tech businesses, because you need so much developer power. You don't make any money until you hit whatever level and you can't generate revenue. But if you have a product where you can generate revenue from, from the start, then I don't think that you should raise money until you've got some traction. What, you, what do you invest most of your money in now, right? Because obviously you're creating this profits. So obviously yeah. you know to pay yourself and your family, everybody like that as well. What are you trying to expand within the business or where are you using that money to kind of pay it forwards? I would say in marketing, obviously acquiring more users. I would say in product. Um, so that's that's the big one, really, uh, where you're investing in better equipment so you can deliver a better quality product to the customer. But then also like the digital product, always working on like improving our like kind of, we don't have an app, but like our web app experience, staff as well, because in a way investing in like yeah the people is one of the biggest things that's how the business can continue to grow um so yeah hiring more people i think those are the main things really and what have been some of the biggest challenges because if i imagine if i started a food business one of the things i'd be worried most about is like all of the regulations and making sure that like if you have one bad batch what then happens how yeah. do you cope with all of that kind of problems so biggest challenges i would say yeah, operations are a very are a huge challenge in food but because we've grown quite small and organically or like it's obviously like a, a significantly sized business now but that obviously hasn't happened overnight. Um, so it's like first starting and then like, because we've done it quite slowly, it hasn't been that much of an issue. There are always moments when we're like, oh, there's a certain challenge, like delivery. We can't get the deliveries far enough or, and then we're like, okay, well, what do we need to do? We need to like change our whole delivery model or shelf life. The, shelf, the meal's not lasting long enough. What can we do? We'll invest in a new um, like packing technology or too many customers complaining because we're using plastic containers. Oh, what are we going to do? We're going to go out and find a whole new uh, packaging supplier. But yeah, I feel like a lot of things happen slowly and iteratively over time. What do you enjoy the most yourself, like in the business? Um, not the operations. Uh, <laughs> so Jay manages the operations and very lucky that he does that because he's really good at it. Um, and we have a really great kitchen team. I mean, like any part of the business is enjoyable, but it's best when you can focus on one thing and, and, and really do that well. So I pretty much do everything that isn't the operations. So whether that be like the brand and marketing side of things, whether it be like kind of customer experience, the website, the data side of things, the strategy. You obviously rebranded fairly recently. What was behind that rebrand and the, like, why did you choose Simmer and what does that represent? Yeah. So the reason why we changed name, well, mainly because we needed a name change and also like just to to, to make it a bit more aesthetic. Because um, I think brand is really important, um, especially when it comes to like FFCG and like food. So that's why we need to change the name. Um, because rice spice wasn't representative of what we did anymore and the process took a long time we landed on simmer and it just kind of just made sense because is there any relation to your name there at all yeah yeah there is i think because obviously it's such a like people buy from people and one of our successes is that people like people have always resonated with myself jay mum, and the story so definitely that was the element of that of that there it's also like a quite a nice word like it's two syllables it's short it's happy everyone can pronounce it it's kind of like a warm word like you associate simmer with like with food and warmth and also like i guess there's a bit of a metaphor there in terms of like for us we obviously what we sell is food but what we actually sell is like time it's like it's um health it's uh satisfaction for food it's a feeling of of like kind of more confidence and and, and like empowerment so in a way we help people simmer up and i think it's quite a nice metaphor because we we don't like make them like work so much that they have to boil over but they're not just kind of flat and, and not achieving and progressing they're kind of simmering up nicely you, you share your business journey a lot for your linkedin in particular like i've seen you there a lot what was the reason behind that? Was it always something you just did or um, have you found that journey? And obviously you're getting a lot of outreach and obviously people like me messaging you, right? I think it is like, obviously our biggest strength is our story. It's very unique and it's like, it's an interesting story. I think it's also quite relatable and very like understand, like it's quite simple, um, which is why it's probably so relatable as well. And I think people are just genuinely interested because everyone understands food. A lot of people are interested in business and it's not something super complex. So people were just asking about it all the time. So I obviously understand that there's interest there. And to be honest, because when we started, we didn't have any marketing budget. And we had to do things like organically and organic social media. Uh, and I realized you can post some stuff about food, but I don't think it's that interesting, to be honest. And I found that whenever we posted about the business story or updates, it would just get a lot more engagement. So I was like, okay, this is working. I enjoy writing about this stuff or producing content on this so much more. I'm going to carry on doing this. And then, yeah, people have really engaged with it. People have... I think they gain value from it. I enjoy the process of creating that. So just 
made sense to carry on doing it and it's, it's good for business. Do you have any tips for anybody who might want to try and do the same thing as you've done to grow their business? Yeah, I would say that like storytelling is really important. So it's just about telling stories, really. Um, I would say, yeah, that's what we've always, always focused on storytelling and just like being consistent. Yeah. So we're going to move to quick fire questions now. So the first one is who are free British Asians that you'd love to shout out for the amazing work they're doing? Um, so obviously I can't not shout out my brother, Jay. And he does a great job, especially on the operation side of our business. Then I would say Akash Meta, um, who's doing a great job with Fable and Main. And then Ahana uh, Banerjee, who is working on Clear. Great. So I think I've interviewed, well, I've interviewed two of those three already. So we'll get Jay on in the future as well. The next one is if people listening right now could reach out to you for help or guidance or learn more about you and Simmer, mm -hmm. what would you advise them? Yeah, I would say that um, LinkedIn is probably the best thing to, to, to do. I always find that like, obviously when I first started, I try and reach out to lots of people for help and lots of people don't respond. Um, and I understand why, because obviously they're busy and I always try to like personalize my outreach as much as I could. So like I do get lots of people reaching out to me on, on Instagram, on, on, on LinkedIn, whatever it, it may be. Um, and sometimes I feel like that outreach can be quite lazy uh, and I'm not going to kind of respond to that because there's so much things, but like if there is someone who has like clearly done their research, I'd always say as well, you shouldn't ask someone a question that you can find on the internet like quite easily. Um, so there's uh, like a more genuine question then sure. And then on the other side, is there anything you need help with right now or Simmer needs help with? So I mentioned before what we're investing in is definitely like people and hiring. So it's very, we're very busy. We're growing lots at the moment, um, but we're always looking for good people to work in the team. So if you're based in Hertfordshire and you want to work in like an operations role, um, then definitely um, give us a shout and you'll be working with Jay. But we're always looking out for like good kind of like marketers, um, especially people who are more like content focused. Um, so if you're kind of looking for a marketing role in a, in a fun startup, then sure, like send me a personalized connection request um, on LinkedIn and we'll chat. So thanks so much for coming on today. Have you got any final words to the audience? Not really. <laughs> I'll just say, yeah, make sure you follow Simmer, uh online, follow me on, on LinkedIn and stuff like that. I think, yeah, the, the one thing that I would say is like, if you're listening to this because you're interested in business, it's great to be learning, to consuming like um, conversations like this, but try like, hopefully there's one thing in particular, and it might be different for each person that you resonate with us on, on, on this chat and try and actually put that into action. Try and do something off the back of that. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for listening. It means a huge amount to us. And we don't think you realise how important you are. Because if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, if you leave us a five-star review, it makes a world of difference. And if you believe in what we're trying to do here, to inspire, connect and guide the next generation of British Asians, if you do those things, you can help us achieve that mission. And you can help us make a bigger impact. And by doing that, it means we can get bigger guests, we can host more events, we can do more for the community. So you can play a huge part. So thank you so much for supporting us.